Okay, welcome everybody. Today we have Ali Mustafa Zadi. You all know Ali. So whenever you're ready, Ali, please go ahead. I am ready. Okay. Okay. Today I'll talk about this propagating wave approximation. Um, this is a joint work with my collaborator, Parhang Doran from Isfahan University of Technology, and it's based on these two papers, especially this red one. Um, so I'll begin with very simple, quick introduction to scattering theory in one dimension and talk about its dynamical formulation very fast and uh, explain how it extends to two dimensions. And I'll talk about evanescent waves in two dimensions and what I mean by propagating wave approximation. Um, this approximation involves uh, scattering by non-local potentials. I explain what, how they are constructed, and then I'll give examples of potentials for which this approximation is exact. And finally, I very briefly give final results on this existence problem for transfer matrices for these non-local potentials. And then I conclude with some final remarks. Um, so scattering in one dimension, stationary scattering is defined by in terms of uh, potential, which can in principle be complex valued, and it can also depend on K, so it can be energy dependent, but it's local potential. And I assume that this is a short range potential, which means that uh, it goes to zero faster than one over X, when X goes to plus or minus infinity, so that the scattering uh, is well-defined. And that means that asymptotically, all solutions of the time independent Schrodinger equation are plane waves at plus or minus infinity. They are superpositions of right going and left going uh, plane waves with some coefficients, which can depend on K and can be complex. Um, and there is this matrix which connects the coefficients at minus infinity to coefficients at plus infinity, which is called the transfer matrix. Well, among the solutions of the Schrodinger equation are the so-called scattering solutions. If you scatter a wave which comes from the left, then the asymptotic form of the solution for this corresponding incident wave has this form, the first term here is the incident wave. This, which goes to the left at x minus infinity is the reflected wave, and this is the transmitted wave, and the coefficients are called reflection and transmission amplitudes. And you can also send the wave from the right. You have the incident wave here, reflected and transmitted waves, and again, these are called left, right, reflection and transmission amplitudes. And just, just substituting these formulas for the coefficients in general and using the definition of the transfer matrix, you see that the reflection and transmission amplitudes are uniquely determined in terms of the entries of this matrix M. So finding transfer matrix is as good as solving the scattering problem for the potential. A while back, I showed in this paper here that this transfer matrix can be expressed or identified with the evolution operator for a Hamiltonian, it's a matrix Hamiltonian of this form, which depends on X where X plays the role of time. And um, this generates some dynamics. If you take X as the ev evolution parameter and the evolution operator is defined standard way using the time dependent Schrodinger equation. This Hamiltonian is obvious if you look at it, even for real potentials is not Hermitian. And you can even show that it's not even diagonalizable. And this applies to all real and complex potentials if they are sh short range. It is good to also write this formula in this way, more compact way, because 
this matrix K will also turn up in two dimensions. It's a simple two by two matrix. Sigma three is the Pauli matrix, uh, which will show up later. Well, because M is given in terms of the evolution operator for a time in quotes, dependent Hamiltonian, uh, you can write it as a time ordered exponential, which essentially means that this is formally equivalent to this Dyson series, where the integrals that the, the operators, age, the matrices H are time ordered. Now, this is already useful because you see the Hamiltonian is proportional to the potential. So if you have a weak potential, the higher order terms in the series will be smaller and smaller by cutting them, uh, truncating the series, you get perturbation here. So in that sense, it's useful. There are many other applications of this which I talked in the past five, six years. Okay, how does this generalize to two dimensions? Again, we define a scattering through some potential, which again, is assumed to be um, short range. And that means that asymptotically, you have solutions of this form. This is a scattering solution. Um, the first term corresponds to the incident wave. And the second term is the asymptotic um, expression for the scattered wave. K0 is the incident wave vector. Uh, theta0 is the incidence angle. R is the position vector r theta are polar coordinates and f of theta is the scattering amplitude and the aim is to find this f of theta uh, for given potential. Now suppose that you have a potential which is non-zero only within this strip in the xy plane. So outside this blue region, it vanishes. Uh, the general case can be obtained by taking the limits of a minus plus two plus minus infinity. Well, in that case, I can also define left incident and right incident waves by following the following setup. So I put my source of the incident wave to minus x equals to minus infinity. So it's the source lies on this line, uh, which is parallel to y axis and it's located at x equals to minus infinity. And then this waves comes, scatters, and parts of it returns to the x equals to minus infinity. Parts of it is transmitted to x equals to plus infinity. And I have detectors, this uh, orange semicircles represent detectors. And I detect how this, what the scattered wave is. And this is the standard definition of the uh, scattered wave vector. And I can also take the source and put it at x equals to plus infinity, and this I call right incident wave. Now, when the potential vanishes, then obviously the Schrodinger time independent Schrodinger equation becomes Helmholtz equation, and you can easily find its solutions using Fourier analysis. And you can show that all solutions are superpositions of the plane wave solutions, which are oscillatory functions of X and Y, and also solutions which are called evanescent wave solutions. Uh, the reason is that you see P is a kind of uh, Y component of momentum or the wave vector, and the X component and Y components are not independent because their square should add up to K square. So there is no reason why P should be between minus K and K. If it is between minus k and k, then these are both trigonometric functions. And if not, then the first exponential becomes, an uh, exponent becomes a real number. So it's exponentially growing or decaying. Usually evanescent waves are associated with decaying waves, but I use a more general um, definition here. <coughs> now I can, unify these and write it like this by introducing this function omega of p, uh, which again, I will use repeatedly later. When I use this notation, then p can be any real number. Now, when you do a scattering, you're interested in bounded solutions. You don't want 
things to exponentially grow at infinity. So, um, and the general solution is superpositions of these uh, plane wave or oscillatory solutions and the uh, evanescent waves. And I know that outside this strip, when x exceeds a plus and is less than a minus, the potential vanishes. So they sh the solution should be superpositions of uh, either oscillatory waves like these or the evanescent waves. But the evanescent waves corresponding to x less than a minus should decay at minus infinity. That's why one of the signs should be chosen here. And at x bigger than a plus, you reach to x plus infinity. So you don't want exponentially growing. So you choose minus. So this is the most general case. This is simple Fourier um, expansion of solutions of the Helmholtz equation. Now, these functions which appear here are arbitrary. These are kind of Fourier coefficients with some normalization. Uh, here, P is, ex I mean, runs from minus state to K. Uh, so these are functions from minus K to K. I will extend their definition to whole real line by de demanding that they vanish outside this interval. And the C's exist only outside this interval, so I demand that inside they are zero. This is just to fix these as functions of all real uh, variable p. Now, I need to introduce this function space, very loose. Well, I call all complex valued functions that I need um, elements of this curly f, and f with sub k are those functions which vanish outside this interval this interval here, f sub k. Certainly this a plus minus and b plus minus belong to this function space because they vanish outside this interval. Now, what happens if I look at the asymptotic expression for um, the solution? Well, asymptotically, uh, these evanescent waves decay, so they do not survive. Only the oscillatory waves survive. So all the information about the scattering are contained in these A's and B's. And I will use the definition of the transfer matrix in one dimension extended to something which works in two dimensions. And this time you see these A's and B's in one dimension, they were just numerical, they, they were numbers. They were scalar functions of K. Here, they are not numbers. They depend on P, so they are functions. And although I write it like in, as if I'm multiplying a matrix by this column vector, but really, this is no longer a matrix. It's an operator. Remember, A's and B's belong to this function space. So this is an operator which runs, which maps two component functions from this function space to itself, which I call with, we denoted out by F sub K squared. So the transfer matrix now is a linear operator. It's not a um, matrix. OK, now let's go back to this left incident, right incident setups when I do scattering. Well, I use P0 and omega P0 for the y and x components of the incident wave vector uh, because this is a real va vector. This P0 must lie between minus K and K. Otherwise, this will be complex, which you don't want. And let's look at what happens when I send X to minus infinity. Remember, asymptotically, at minus infinity, I have just the incident wave. And there is part of the wave which is scattered and comes back to the, uh, us, uh, the detectors at X equals to minus infinity. So this says that you see this A minus should produce this term, B minus, I don't know. But also I know that there is nothing coming from the right-hand side. The coefficient of the waves which come from plus infinity towards the scatterer is B plus. So that should be 0. Um, and that means that at x going to plus infinity, I'll just have a plus term, a the plus term should be absent. And just by comparison, 
you can show that in order for you, well, this is already zero, I know. And this A minus, if, you, if it's necessary to give you this thing, it must be a delta function with these coefficients which kills this. So in other words, for left incident wave, A minus and B plus are fixed. B minus and A plus, you need to find. And that is equivalent to solving the scattering problem as I'll show in a minute. Okay, first of all, so A minus B plus are given, and I have the definition of the transfer matrix. Now I have written it in terms of its entries, each of which is an operator. And just by substitution, you can find that A plus and B minus, which were not fixed, are related to, uh, are, give, are given by these entries of the transfer matrix according to these equations. The first equation gives you A plus in terms of B minus. The second equation is actually, as you see, this is a linear operator. So it's a non-homogeneous linear equation. And then you do examples solve uh, specific examples, you'll see that this is actually an integral equation. So if you can solve this integral equation, you get B plus, you substitute, you get A plus. And this delta with P zero is the Dirac delta function centered at P zero. <clears throat> well, it is, we, in this paper, we also showed that the scattering amplitude is given in terms of this A plus B minus. So the solution of the scattering problem reduces to this integral equation if you know the transfer matrix. You solve this, you get B minus, that already gives you A plus, you substitute here and you get F of theta. The same thing works also for right incident waves. This time the incident vector, wave vector comes from uh, plus infinity. That's why its X component is negative. Uh, and then by similar arguments, you find that the scattering amplitude has this form, again, given by A, A plus and B minus. But this, this time, this equations become simpler. OK. Next, I want to introduce this projection operator. This is the projection operator, which project, projects functions with two components to this interval. It cuts the values of the function, makes it zero when p is bigger than or equal to um, k and less than or equal to minus k. Then uh, we could prove that the transfer matrix is given in terms of evolution operator for certain Hamiltonian after you project by this projection operator. This Hamiltonian has this form. It's very similar to its one dimensional analog. In one dimension, you had this K. This was a scalar, so it didn't matter where I put it. And rather than one over omega, I had one over K. It's almost exactly the same thing, but this time this V has a hat here over Y, which makes it an operator. And omega is also an operator. But omega hat is just multiplication of functions of P by omega of P. Remember this omega P was this function. Sigma three is Pauli matrix. Y hat is standard uh, position operator. I'm in the momentum space, so it acts like differentiation with respect to P. K is the same uh, simple two by two matrix. You can actually write it more explicitly. It's a two by two matrix with operator entries. Um, this U hat I introduced to be this thing. And this operator here, V, X, Y, where Y is replaced by Y hat, you can properly define it in terms of this formula here. So you have to take the Fourier transform of your potential with respect to Y, and then you evaluate this convolution integral. 
And that gives you how this operator acts on a test function f. So this theorem says that in order for me to get the transfer matrix, I have to project this time ordered exponential for this Hamiltonian by this projection operator p. Again, I rewrote the definitions of this projection operator and h. Now I introduce a hybrid notation so that I can talk about what I mean by this approximation scheme. So I look at the um, wave functions, psi, and I use this formula to define a function which takes real numbers to complex numbers. That is, I take x like a parameter and then evaluate functions of f of x, uh, psi of x as psi of x, y. y is the independent variable now. And then I can write this time independent Schrodinger equation in this form, where y hat is again position uh, operator y hat, p hat is the good old momentum along the y direction. This time, this projection operator that I had for two component waves, well, I can write it for the, the, the one component thing. I can write it in terms of this uh, formula. Uh, and you can check that obviously this is true, so it agrees with my earlier definition. Now I want to go back to this splitting of the solutions in terms of oscillating plus evanescent waves. You see these formulas that I have written here worked for x less than or equal to a minus and x bigger than or equal to a plus, where the potential vanished. Okay. These coefficients a's and b's were zero outside this interval minus k k and c plus minus were in zero inside that interval, just remind you of this formulas. Well, because of this, if I project these a's and b's, they don't change because already outside the interval, they are zero. Remember projection just makes everything outside the interval minus kk equal to zero, but it will eliminate c plus k, c plus minuses because they are already zero inside. So now make them, zero outside, they will go away. Oops. Now, you see, obviously, if I take the projection operator apply to this integral, it will cut, uh, it will um, commute with functions of P and hit in these A's and B's. So it will kill the oscillating part. Oh, sorry, it, it will kill the evanescent part. And it doesn't change the oscillatory part because A's and B's don't change. But remember, these are all valid when X is bigger than A plus and less than or less than A minus, right? Now I define oscillatory part and evanescent part of the whole solution by these formulas. So my argument is that these are equalities when X is outside minus A minus A plus, now I define them to be true also inside that interval. <clears throat> so again, I have written down the definitions of this projection operator. The splitting here is, in, I mean, obvious because I have defined it like this. And now what I mean by propagating wave approximation is that I'm going to ignore the evanescent wave contributions to the scattering phenomenon. Now you might say, well, well, when you look at the asymptotic form of the solution, they are not even there. But the point is that first you have to solve the Schrodinger equation everywhere on the uh, xy plane and then take the asymptotic form. You can't just put by hand uh, evanescent waves everywhere equal to zero. If you do, you're restricting yourself and that is what I mean by approximation. Okay. Now let's see what this means or how I can quantify this. Well, I had the Schrodinger equation written down in this hybrid notation. If I project this equation on using this projection operator, I can write it in terms of two equations 
which couples actually oscillating part and the evanescent part of the wave. I have written one of them because the other one I don't need. See what would happen is that the coupling term here says you can in general ignore it because if you don't know this, you can't find psi oscillating. When I do this approximation, I assume that this term does not contribute to the scattering amplitude. Okay, so that is quantitatively uh, the meaning of this approximation. Um, this operator is just a projection of the potential term. And this is, well, this is the projection and it's the, the complementary projection. So when I ignore this uh, evanescent phase, the Schrodinger equation reduces to this equation, which is almost a Schrodinger equation, but this time, rather than this local potential, oh, I have this operator here. This operator you can use to define a new potential and look what that tells you. If you substitute everything, you see that this potential, this operator or this quantity is actually, in, it involves integrals of y. So this is a non-local potential. You need to know the values of the wave function for all values of y to determine what vk of psi is. It is also energy dependent because these integrals involve k. k squared is the energy. So this propagating wave approximation is equivalent to doing scattering theory for this type of energy dependent non-local potentials. You give me a local potential, I can uniquely determine the corresponding non-local one. Now, let's see what happens if I take energy to be very, very large. And in that case, you see this k goes to plus infinity, this projection operator becomes identity. And therefore, if you look at this definition, you see this becomes identity. So this is identically zero. So this is already gone. And that says that this approximation is a valid approximation for high energies. In this sense, it's very much like WKV. It's a high energy approximation. Uh, in this paper, we also proved that actually you can't if you want to solve the Schrodinger equation for a short range potential, you can't ignore evanescent waves as far as the solution all over the real um, plane is concerned. However, when you do scattering, you only use the asymptotic form of the wave. Therefore, it can happen that ignoring this uh, evanescent waves everywhere does not change the outcome of the scattering problem for you. Actually, I'll give examples where this approximation is exact. So you ignore it and nothing happens and you get the exact result. Okay, so how do I deal with this um, non-local potentials? Well, I'll try to use my transfer matrix method. Again, I remind you that this transfer matrix is an operator from these two component functions. And this function space contains functions which vanish outside minus kk. The transfer matrix for uh, my initial potential is given in terms of time order exponential projected. The Hamiltonian which comes in is here. So this is the general non-approximate exact case. Now, what happens if you do the approximation? The approximation amounts to changing the potential to this non-local potential. That means putting this projection operators around it. And if you look at the formula for this H, well, putting um, these projection operators around V is the same as putting it around H, because these are functions that kind of, these are all commuting with these projection operators, except the potential term. And using this argument, you actually can show that the approximate transfer matrix is obtained by changing the Hamiltonian to this projected Hamiltonian. 
And you even don't need to put these projection operators outside because already these contain these projection operators. The square of a projection operator is the same as the projection operator. Okay. So let's look more closely at this Dyson series. You see, when I do the projection, already the first term contains this projected Hamiltonian. With the second term, I don't have projection between the two H's. So the difference between the exact and this approximate starts with the second order term in the Dyson series. Okay? In other words, if <clears throat> your potential is weak, so that the second and higher order terms in this Dyson series are negligible, then this approximation is valid. And this shows that this propagating wave approximation is a valid approximation for weak potentials. In other words, if you do firstborn approximation, it'll agree with this approximation for a weak potential. <coughs> Let's take an example. This is the delta function of x times some function of y. For this type of potential, this Hamiltonian simplifies because of this delta function, these x here and there are zero. So these exponential terms drop. And you get, just put a hat on this uh, y inside g, so you get this. Sorry, can I ask a question? <clears throat> when you talk about Dyson series and approximation and stuff, um, do you have any sort of norm on these spaces? Because these also seem to be sort of unbounded operators and okay. stuff, right? So uh, what does I'll, that mean? I'll have three slides at the end on this topic. So I'll, I'll address it there. Okay. So up to this point, it's all formal, which is good for physicists. but I will talk about the, the divergence and the, the convergence and things like that, the domains of operators. Okay, thanks. Okay, so for this particular example, you see uh, the matrix nature of H comes from K, but K squared is zero. So when I take the second order term, this is, this is like a scalar, you get K squared times a scalar, but K squared is zero. So the second order and higher order terms are all zero. So for this type of potentials, already the higher order terms are zero and the, first, the, the only contribution comes from the first order term, but that is as good as what you would get by this approximation. In other words, for these potentials, this uh, approximation is actually exact. This is one simple example. For example, if you have G also, uh, linear combination of some delta functions. That means you have point scatters along the y-axis so that the potential has this form. Then you can use this scheme to get very simple, in a very short time, the expression for the scattering amplitude. And everything is finite. And there's a huge literature on the scattering by point interactions. And using the standard methods like lipman schuler equation or Green's function methods, which are essentially the same, you understand, I mean, you hit to these terms which diverge and you have to renormalize, regularize, and then do coupling constant renormalization to deal with these potentials. But this scheme avoids all that. There is no, nothing blowing up and everything is finite. This paper, has plenty of explanation on delta function potentials and the subtleties of renormalization. I don't have time to, uh, there are pretty interesting points here. Okay. <clears throat> this is another class of potentials for which this approximation is exact. Suppose you have a potential such that it's Fourier transform with respect to Y vanishes on half axis, other negative have access or positive have access, then you can show, then the proof is here, that this approximation again is exact. The proof is a little subtle, not very difficult, but subtle. And I can't give it here, but 
all the details are in this paper. <clears throat> For example, you can choose an arbitrary function of x, which is uh, finite, I mean, short range. And then you can easily show that this type of functions, if you take the Fourier transform with respect to y, they will vanish on the negative half axis. So for this type of potentials, which are complex, this approximation is exact. Now, uh, the last topic I want to discuss is has to do with the subtle mathematical issues. So I define this transfer matrix as an evolution, I mean, in terms of evolution operator for some Hamiltonian, which has this form. Well, this is a time ordered exponential. So there are several mathematical questions which comes to mind. First of all, what do I mean by an operator in mathematics? I have to understand that what the topology of the function space is, this operator acts on. So I want it to be at least closed operator, which is densely defined. So I need to first specify a function space on which this operator is defined. And I have to make sure the domain is dense. After that, well, if you work with Hilbert spaces, this omega inverse is an unbounded operator. So you are trying to define dynamics by an unbounded operator, there is no guarantee that it exists. That means this uh, Dyson series uh, may not make sense. <laughs> For example, when I, I mean, multiply these two operators, this makes sense if uh, the range of the first one is in the domain of the other one. Otherwise, <laughs> the, the, the domain becomes empty for the product. And furthermore, who says, and it once said, and in what sense this series converges or not? And finally, in the first line, I put plus minus infinity. That means I have to define what I mean by this limit. So even if the operator exists, I have to make sure that these limits also exist. And these are very difficult mathematical uh, problems. The whole project which brought us to this approximation scheme was started by our attempt to see if we can deal with these problems. It turned out that we couldn't do the general local potential, but for the non-local potentials that appear here, these can be done. So I will quickly give you the highlights of this. First of all, I need to put some restrictions on my the class of potentials that I want. So I introduce I'll take potentials which are bounded integrable functions, and I pick two positive numbers, S and K. I'll say that this potential belongs to this class C, S, K. If these two conditions are satisfied, the first one says there are numbers alpha, beta, sigma positive, such that sigma is bigger than this S. And for all X is with absolute value bigger than or equal to alpha, this inequality holds. This is essentially a decay rate condition. For example, if sigma is one, the potential is short range. Uh, but this is not in one dimension, but I'm, this only restricts the, the, the decay along the x uh, axis. And the second one looks a little complicated, but look, Remember, I had the Fourier transform of V with respect to P. I define this, I, I take this and define a function of, I look at it as a function of P. So for each X, I have a function of P, which is given by this. Now, because these are um, uniformly continuous functions, it's uh, as a function of X, this is bounded. So I can look at this V check as a function which takes Xs to bounded functions from minus K to K, L infinity functions from minus two K to K. 
So this is also a condition on the potential because it's a condition on its um, Fourier transform. And I demand that this function is a continuous function. This is a, this has a sup norm and this is ordinary um, topology of R. Well, for example, if you have finite range potentials, this is okay. And for physical reasons, this is as good as you want. Then we can prove the following theorem. If the potential is of class C3K, so it goes faster uh, than one over X cube uh, to zero when X goes to infinity, then the following hold. For every X, this uh, Hamiltonian that we had is an unbounded non adjoint operator, which acts on this function space. Remember all, func the, all the functions were zero outside minus K on K. So you can actually project everything to this Hilbert space of two component functions that square integrable. And their domain is given by this formula. So remember these acts on two component functions and the domain consists of the two component functions such that their sum belongs to this R R is actually the range of omega. Remember this, there was this omega uh, operator. So I have explicitly written it down. R is the range of this operator. So if you add them up and these are in the range, then this gives you a subspace of this space, which actually is dense. And I define this operator H hat K, the projected Hamiltonian on this subset. And then you can show that the range of that operator is actually contained the domain. So you can compose any number of H's. So the terms in the Dyson series, each of them make sense. <laughs> Furthermore, that series actually converges strongly on D and the limits that I need to introduce the transfer matrix also exists as strong limits on this domain D. And that completes the answer to this question about whether these make sense mathematically. All this is a very, um, uh, I mean, complicated, I mean, not complicated, the standard tools of function analysis, but I can't, I mean, talk about them here. All the details are in this paper, which is published recently. So let me conclude. So I talked about this propagating wave approximation. I told you what it is. I showed that it can be exact, uh, but one needs to uh, work out specific examples, see how it, how it, when it's not exact, how much different it is from the exact results and requires numerical work, which I am not an expert. So there's plenty of room to look into uh, the utility of this uh, propagating wave approximation. I showed that it amounts to looking at the scattering for certain uh, non-local potentials. And for these non-local potentials, there is a well-defined transfer matrix. Still for local potentials, the existence of this transfer matrix is an open problem. And I have no clue because this uh, operators which enter in its definition are badly unbounded operators. One thing which is very interesting is that all the operators which come into and constitute this uh, Hamiltonian and Dyson series are constructed out of uh, Hilbert-Schmidt operators and they act on this function space, which is finite domain. So that Hilbert-Schmidt operators are compact operators. So they can be uh, very well approximated by finite matrices. <clears throat> and that says that it should be very easy to implement this approximation numerically. You can reduce everything to matrices and do very, very uh, good numerics, very stable numerics using this. Again, this is an open problem for interested people. Here are the references. This Most of what I talked about was the second reference and the final mathematical issues in the last reference. And that's all I wanted to do say thank you very much thank you very much Ali thank you very much Ali questions Fabio has a question for some time 
Uh, Ali, thank you very much. Uh, can you go back for a moment to the previous slide, the one with the domain? Oh, okay, this one. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have some easy way to show that D is a dense domain because there is this strange condition that um, um, make a, uh, require some relation between two comp or components, P plus and P minus. So I'm wondering maybe one component is very bad and the other is very nice and so Not they are... No, no, look, it's actually very easy to see why it's dense. You see, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> if you take two component functions, both of which from R, R is dense. So this contains a dense subset. So therefore it is dense. Okay, so you're, okay. Oh, okay. So R is dense because it contains for the, the, the... It's a range of self-adjoint operators. Yeah. Okay, okay. So okay, it thank, is, is dense. thank you. Joshua. Hi, Ali. Thank you for your Hi. talk. Uh, I don't remember if you referred to this in previous uh, 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 talks about this subject, but your uh, Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian, the transfer matrix, uh, or in particular your matrix script K, it's um, a Jordan form, right? This nil potent matrix. Yes. And, yes. Uh, so it's tuned exactly to the to the special uh, exceptional point, right? So um, am I right by saying that the exceptional points of your uh, uh, effective Hamiltonian are the uh, resonances of the system? I mean, it looks like if I look, I, I played with it while while you were talking, and uh, it it looked as if you. Uh, eigen, the, 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 there is only one zero eigenvalue for this. Yes, matrix. yes. Uh, and, uh, and the eigenvector is, looks like an, an, an no incoming wave or not, no outgoing wave. It looks like a resonance. At least in well, one way, I suppose also in 2D, in each channel. You see, is the it, point is that what affects the scattering is not the eigenvalue and eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian. No, no, no. Okay, no, no, I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about properties of this uh, Hamiltonian because it's not a remission, so it has exceptional point. Right, right. Well, in one dimension, it's already um, Jordan block. So yes. it is at the exceptional point. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the potential is just, it's like a multiplication of this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm asking what's the meaning of this exceptional, there is an eigenvector uh, corresponding to this uh, zero eigenvalue. What yeah. does it mean? What does it mean? I think it is a resonance. It's the resonance of the system. And I suppose this is general, generalized also to, high, to the two-dimensional case for each, each channel in the scattering, each, each angle. Uh, I, th I think it should work uh, also there. But for 1D, it looks like, like the resonance of your system. Do you, yeah. do you agree? Or have you thought about it? Well, I, I thought about it, but I don't need... I don't know what you mean by the resonance. What I can do, and which, which I did. Well, resonance is uh, when you when you get something out. Uh, no, 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 I know what you resonance you're is. Anything in, okay? Or... I don't know that I know. But what do you mean by the resonance of this Hamiltonian? I mean, you... no, 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 no. The resonance of the original system, the eigenvector at the exceptional point. I think is a resonance state of the original of the original Hamiltonian of the original okay. setting. Okay, in in one dimension, uh, resonances are related to the transfer matrix. They are zeros of the M two two entry of the transfer matrix. Okay. So I cannot directly relate the M two two entry of the transfer matrix. Okay, but I, to I, I would just. I was just looking what yeah. is the zero eigenvector, I mean the yeah. eigenvector of the exceptional point, and it looks like either the resonance or the anti-resonance, something, one of them, I, I, it was hard, I mean, I was listening to you, so I yeah. didn't yeah. pay too much attention to the to the details, but it looks like one of these. But um, there is a related issue, which is important, and that is, you see, um, this is time in the time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? Yes. So if you perform a um, transformation by this exponentials, this mm -hmm. exponentials, you see, 
uh, just rotate, mm -hmm. a rotating frame in, in a sense. But what will yeah. happen is that this Hamiltonian becomes a Hamiltonian, which is no longer Jordan block. Mm. And then that Hamiltonian can develop exceptional points. It's again um, a non Hermitian Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. And we actually looked at this. And mm -hmm. that exceptional points has a very nice physical meaning. I mean, that was actually my initial plan to present here, but it was so complicated that I decided I, I don't want to <laughs> spend that much time. Th this is. I can send you the reference, and it's, it's okay, it has okay. direct applications, also physical applications. Okay, but but I think uh, you should look into the eigenvector of the exceptional point and try to see what it means in the origin in terms of the original okay. Hamiltonian. I think it's okay. the reference. Okay, thank you. Okay. More questions, comments. No one. And let's uh, thank Ali again. Thank you very much, Ali, for the nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to August. Yeah. <laughs> Hope every one of you can come. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you very much.